I don't understand your resistance. And I don't think anyone else will either. In the future, the most popular sport is a violent mishmash game where the objective of the game is to mishmash the other team. It's a sport where, like the song Anything Goes, Anything Goes. Rollable. The greatest number of players and substitutes put out of action by a single player in a single game, 13. A world record, courtesy of your dear self. Rollerball was a 1975 film where in the future countries have disappeared and after the corporate wars six monopolistic companies controlling individual industries all make the big decisions. Let me just check my calendar. Hmm. The film was set in 2018 so hmm. in Houston the energy company controls everything. Oof. Company executives are all powerful and my calendar app has just crashed. Rollerball is the most popular sport. It's a potent mix of hockey, MMA, high ally, roller derby, demolition derby, and an altercation with a nightclub bouncer at 2 a.m. They dream they're great rollerballers. Hmm? Yeah. They dream they're Jonathan. They have muscles. They bash in faces. The league's best player is softly spoken Jonathan E. He's been the top rollerball player for years now, and the company has decided that he should retire executives who want you out. Head of the Energy Corporation, Mr. Bartholomew, gives Jonathan E. the news in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, though the player is still harboring some resentment over an executive taking his wife away from him a little while earlier. Jonathan E. asks a few questions. Well, we think he does because he does mumble quite a bit. I'm considering it, Mr. Bartholomew. And even switching on the subtitles does not particularly help. Here at the center personally. Are you? Cut my finger. Let's get yourself another assignment, will you, Dad? His teammate Moon Pie is waiting in the wings as the next big thing in the sport. Sweet dreams, Moon Pie. <laughs> He's also the biggest mouth in rollerball. However, I sure will be annoyed if anything at all unpleasant happens to him around, oh, I don't know, the halfway point of this movie. There must be some mistake. The books you've ordered are classified and have been transcribed and summarized. Jonathan E. wants to find some answers, but there aren't really any ways to find out things in this world. Since he finds out, all information is on a computer in Switzerland. Jonathan E.'s visit there later in the film is frustrating. Misplacing data? Hmm. The whole of the 13th century. And to cap it off, all of the information Jonathan E. is looking for is blocked. The ultimate central computer ultimately turns out to be as useful as an ice-making machine on the Titanic. But can't you do what you're told? People try to convince Jonathan E to play nice and quit. There's a television special on his career which was to have featured him announcing his retirement. Your special is already scheduled and announced all over the world. But Jonathan E has decided he's not going anywhere. His team needs him. Why argue about decisions you're not powerful enough to make for yourself? A game in Tokyo ramps up the pressure on Jonathan E, with several rule changes making the deadly game even more deadly. It's now deadlier than a homicidal death adder with anger issues and easy access to venom. Houston wins the game, but as it's around halfway through the film, Moon Pie is injured badly, kept alive by machines after he's pronounced brain dead. Jonathan E won't sign papers to have his teammates' life support switched off, instead preferring to have his friend live on, sort of. Having heard some of the shit that came out of Moon Pie's mouth throughout this movie, maybe Maybe his teammates just prefer him this way. The pressure on Jonathan E is amped up by his ex-wife Ella showing up. Hello Johnny. The two share their feelings. She's made a new life for herself, though she seems okay with seeing Jonathan for an afternoon of board games like Scrabble, Parcheesi and Boggle. But she's also clearly towing the company line, which finally breaks the spell for Jonathan E. Well, you're my side, that's all. There's one last major attempt at forcing Jonathan out, a no-holds-barred match against New York, where almost all of the game's rules have been suspended, turning the game into a battle royale, with many deaths and injuries leaving Jonathan E. the last man standing. Rollable was a film that did make a decent pop culture impact on its 1975 release, but has been eclipsed by so many other films either eating its lunch, or just films of the time that held up better, or are just better remembered. Its visceral action is presented almost like a contemporary sports broadcast, which, viewed with the lens of today's sports broadcasting, does feel very oldie timey. It also mixes very uneasily with the plot of people pressuring Jonathan to quit and his very half-assed investigation. The film is an odd mix of a 70s paranoid thriller, a sports movie and speculative fiction. 
and I have to say it's entertaining enough, though ultimately it's a bit hollow, like when a gopher rents out their holiday home to a mole. Other future set films have extrapolated from the era they were made in with more bite, if not exactly any more accuracy. A Clockwork Orange looked askance at a future society's acceptance of violence. Robocop entwined an action movie with digs at entertainment and 80s corporate intrigue. The Running Man showed us an absurd future with a man sentenced to a televised gladiatorial battle. All had elements of satirical extrapolation. Rollerball, on the other hand, doesn't really have any additional levels. What you see is pretty much what you get. Somebody's pushing me. Who? Bartholomew? <laughs> it's your Jonathan E. It's like a lot of 70s paranoid thrillers, it does leave a lot of information out because if the protagonist doesn't know what's going on, why the hell should we? You bastards. That leaves a lot of the scenes feeling either like filler or a breather in between the rollerball. They're afraid of you, Jonathan. All the way to the top they are. What are they afraid of me for? There are three rollerball games presented in the movie, at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. The brutality is there, ramping up, like Evil Knievel after he found somebody had put a playing card in the spokes of his motorcycle. If that's all you want from this movie, then great, then rollerball's great, it's fantastic, go for it. But for the rest of the film, so much of what's going on is left unsaid. Something going on in the game. I don't know what it is, I don't think I'm supposed to know. There are brush strokes in world building, which are very broad. I forget what corporation is running what city. We really only see how the major sports star Jonathan E lives. And then we see some executives off their faces at a party where they decide to destroy their boss's garden for shits and giggles. Look, we've all been there, blotto after a work party and using a hand cannon to take out our boss's prize begonias. But well, just me. Somebody paying attention will get that this future isn't as great as it's cracked up to be. But apart from the rising body count from rollerball games, we never really see anybody's... Sorry, I just got a text from my boss. Uh, make that former boss. But apart from the rising body count of rollerball players, we don't actually see anybody's life suffering as a result of corporate control. Unless, of course, it's the boss's gardener. It might have been handy if Rollerball showed us what else people got up to in this world, what else they were into. Maybe they could have dropped in clips of popular reality shows like Farmer Wants a Llama, the grammar esports show You Should Have Paid Attention in School, and of course, Parking Ninja. Oh, he's going too close to the line, he's closer, closer, go! Rollerball does seem quaint in that TV is merely a way to show Rollerball, rather than any major player in this world. Big business does run the sport, but not as a sponsor, most likely as a distraction, because, by the way, you have limited freedom, but now, sport. TV was once described as the opiate of the masses. Rollerball seems to be the amphetamines of the masses. Perhaps Rollerball broadcasts were built as meth CTV. Did Rollerball incite fans to violence or sate them? You know, this movie doesn't care. Uh, Jimmy Khan is speaking. Where's the volume control? It might be I won't ever find out why I've been asked to leave the game. But I do know I can get some concessions, and I want them. James Khan was one of the bigger movie stars of the 70s, with Rollerball being almost an iconic role for what was almost an iconic film. As Jonathan E., he's so softly spoken most of the time that even with perfect hearing, you would need a hearing aid to hold a conversation with him. I think I'll go to one of them computer centers. Where I can find out. And when you do hear him, you'd swear he's somehow channeling a sedated version of Adam Sandler. I don't know, Mr. Bartholomew, I just don't know. I'd tell you to come here and convince me to quit. John Houseman also appears as the softly spoken Bartholomew, one of the few older persons visible in this world. And he's a man stuck between a rock and a hard place, ordered to deal with an intransigent rollerball player. You know, I've always considered your situation, Jonathan, and your needs. Now you have to consider mine. One scene has John Houseman and James Kahn speaking softly together in a quiet room. A scene accompanied by... What the hell did he say, Edna? Bartholomew is our on-screen antagonist, but it appears in some scenes that he answers to somebody higher up the food chain. John Becker's Moon Pie is the anointed successor to teammate Jonathan E. The ganglia. That's a mess of nerves right here under the ear. Now what you gotta do is drive the jawbone up in that mess of nerves and it rings a bell. Moon Pie is an aggressive loudmouth who doesn't rate the danger posed by the opposing eh and is left brain dead as a result. Canadian actor Shane Rimmer played the Houston team's coach. Game! 
this wasn't meant to be a game! An actor who would usually appear as an American in productions based in the UK, though here he's probably got more dialogue in this than most of the US-backed projects that he would appear in. He is still probably best known as the voice of this guy. You have to get out for your own sake. Maud Adams is Jonathan's ex-wife Ella, the woman he pines for until it's clear she's just one more person pressuring him to quit on behalf of the company. Moses Gunn is his former mentor Cletus, who Jonathan first asks to do some snooping on why the company wants him to retire. Pamela Hensley as Mackie is another assigned girlfriend, but one who likes Jonathan more than he's into her. After that is Barbara Trentham as Daphne, a future Mrs. Cleese, who Jonathan takes an instant dislike to, because, well, he can't get over Ella. And poor Ralph Richardson seems like he's wandered into the wrong studio. As far as character development goes, Jonathan E. goes from a guy who just likes rollerball to a guy who doesn't want to quit when he's asked to. He does look half-heartedly for answers and then tries to negotiate some concessions in return for quitting. But then he just stomps his opponents on the track to somehow defeat Bartholomew. Bartholomew, on the other hand, being old, leaves the game early to beat the traffic. The end. The dialogue in this movie rarely explains anything other than to set up some context of why the companies have so much power, but we'll never learn to anyone's satisfaction why they want Jonathan out, nor do we learn what exactly he wants for himself. Don't tell me I can't. Don't ever say that! I can! You can be stopped! Rollerball started off as a short story in Esquire magazine. Its author William Harrison would adapt his own story into a feature film script. Canadian director Norman Jewison had been a name director for years with films like In the Heat of the Night, The Thomas Crown Affair, Fiddler on the Roof and Jesus Christ Superstar, though Rollerball would be his main foray into the realm of speculative fiction. Rollerball was given a reasonable budget to create its futuristic but still recognisable world. It's shot in studios in the UK, which is why there are so many American-sounding actors based in the UK popping up in small roles, along with a few British character actors. Many of the exteriors were shot in the then West of Germany, with the rollerball sequences filmed in an indoor arena that had been built for the 1972 Munich Olympics. There are almost two different films here, a violent exploitation action film shot almost documentary style for the three rollerball matches, and a very lukewarm paranoid thriller. But even calling it a thriller is pushing it, since there's almost no violence outside of the rollerball arenas, apart from the gardening. The threats to Jonathan E. are so incredibly vague that the consequences for Jonathan E. seem barely worth mentioning. It seems the price for not quitting? More nagging. Come on now, Jonathan. Quit it. No. I said quit it. No. How about now? No. The rules of rollerball aren't too specific. You get a heavy ball shot out at you, and you prevent the other team from jamming it in this hole until you can jam it in that hole. There are some guys on bikes, everybody else has skates, there's some guys with these catcher gloves, and then you just beat the shit out of your opponents. The rules are loose enough so that, narratively, they can do almost anything with it, just like other sports made up like Quidditch, The Hunger Games, or, according to Americans, Cricket. I mean, dude, five days? That shit cannot be real. Rollerball's score by Andre Previn wasn't particularly dynamic. There's a pipe organ recording of Bach's to Carter and Fugue in D minor bookending the film, as well as some corporate anthems and a little music here and there, but nothing particularly memorable. Rollerball was an early film to credit the individual stunt performers, but in a budget crunch, they couldn't afford someone to oil the skates. Lock your eyes on the target. Rollerball was a decent-sized box office success at the time. It briefly became a pop culture phenomenon and later spawned a not particularly well-received remake in 2002. There's nothing to match the thriller trundling round that track on my roller skates. A ruddy great metal ball under my arm getting belted over the nut! Once director video films really took off, there would be no end of bloodsport type films, whether they were science fiction or not, where they would just dispense with the roller skates or rules of engagement and just have people wailing on each other for 90 minutes. But I hope you leave enough room for my fist because I'm going to ram it into your stomach and break your goddamn spine! Ah! <laughs> Video games trading on rollerball and similar death sports would proliferate, with it almost becoming a genre in itself. In the future, combat will be televised. It become such a hackneyed cliche as the setting for a video game that by the 2020s, it was almost a given that any new title using that premise would have to be dreamt up by designers and artists with zero imagination or talent. They probably don't bathe very often either. Rollerball is a film you watch for rollerball scenes and then zone out during the dramatic scenes of Jonathan E. mumbling to John. Houseman who whispers back. It's interesting enough, visceral at times, but also strangely tamer than you would expect. It does have to be marked as a good time, but one that doesn't always live up to its potential of its then original premise. 
which has unfortunately since been tainted by decades of lesser imitators. If you enjoyed this review, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos. And it's not roller ball anymore, it's roller egg. <laughs>